Welcome to Indoor Ag Science Cafe. I'm Chair Rick Bora at the Ohio State University Department of Horticulture and Crop Science. Nice to be back in my office. So it's been, what, many months, the last time I was here doing a webinar or cafe. So it's, it's really nice. And then I like to welcome everyone. I see more people showing up. Um, so um, let's start. So Indoor Ag Science Cafe is uh, focusing on um, indoor agriculture, mainly for those um, growing crops um, under 100% electric lighting, but some of the principles, um, of course, are applicable for greenhouse or other type of controlled environment. Um, the project is funded by uh, Optimia USDA um, uh, funding. Um, the group name is called Optimia. And then this is a collaboration between Michigan State University, Ohio State, Purdue, and the University of Arizona. All right, so before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go a little bit um, of our business stuff. Um, so we have a new um, Q&A forum um, built in our project website, Optimia website. Uh, it doesn't require a login, so I think it's easier to use. Um, and then it's it's built in our archive page of CAFE. Um, so if you go to the um, specific video, click on it, and then it shows up um, page like this. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry, I just need to play. And then, um, yeah, so I, I really like to um, use this. And then the, the um, whoever um, asked the question, the notifica notification comes to me, so I should be able to respond really quickly. Um, and then um, some uh, conference information related to this um, technology. The first one is uh, more for greenhouse, but uh, again, the principles apply to um, um, other controlled environment settings, including indoor. Uh, there is a, a open forum type of uh, online meeting. Um, this is free, uh, autonomous greenhouse. So we just want to talk about this. I'm uh, one of the actually organizers for this event, September 10th. Um, October 8th to 10th, um, uh, Japan Plant Factory Association is organizing another um, training. Um, this time, because of the situation they are doing online. Um, more information is available in their website if you're interested to get trained for growing crops under controlled environment using hydroponics and soilless production technique. Um, upcoming CAFE series. Um, so today is the one on the top. Um, I will introduce the title in a minute. Um, and then uh, September 22nd, that's a September uh, cafe. Uh, we will have another back to basic series, uh, hydroponic nutrient management by Dan Gillespie, um, J.R. Peters. And then October, we will be talking more about um, food safety. We had a one speaker before, but we wanted to invite academic speaker for that. And then um, Sanya Ilik from the Ohio State Ohio State, the Ohio State University is going to give a um, presentation, uh, more research-based, but uh, she's very um, familiar with hydroponic industry. So it, it's something you might want to look forward to that. All right. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, today's topical presenters. We have two of them, so that's great. Um, both are from state of New York. Um, Dr. Neil Matson from Cornell University and Marianne Neiman from Rensela Polytechnic Institute or R RPI. Um, they're gonna talk about the most well or most frequently asked question, um, nutrient composition of CEA, CEA leafy greens, a case study on carotenoids of kale, grown in field, greenhouse, or indoor. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing and let them share. Um, Dr. Matson is going to start. Perfect, let me just share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Seems like we're getting some much needed rain in New York, so we're all happy about that this morning. Uh, so I'm gonna give a brief uh, background into our project, uh, and then, uh, 
uh, talk a little bit about this NSF project and then um, Dr. Neiman is our expert that's an analytical chemist at RPI so she'll talk about the actual meat of the experiment with uh, um, kale grown in field greenhouse and indoors. Um, and we'll try to dive right in. So um, all of the, the work on this project comes from um, a National Science Foundation grant. Um, they had a, for several years, they had a, a program that was called Infuse, which is Innovations at the Nexus of Food Energy Water Systems. Uh, and, um, and we have a project that was looking at the scalability of controlled environment agriculture in metropolitan areas. So really kind of focused on urban agriculture, but, but very applicable, of course, to the, the whole industry. Um, I wanted to, so kind of the big perspective of the project was to look at the um, economics and the environmental footprint of different ways of growing. We focus on, on leafy greens, uh, strawberries, and tomatoes, um, and kind of the macroeconomics of this project had us uh, looking at the, um, uh, had us looking at um, uh, leafy green or lettuce, um, tomatoes, and strawberries, um, producing them in metropolitan areas in the U.S. in these different climate zones. So, so far we have a, a lettuce paper that's out looking at the economics of lettuce in a field in New York or in California in Salinas and shipping uh, 2,000 miles to Chicago or 3,000 miles to New York. Um, or growing that uh, crop in greenhouses or vertical farms uh, in New York or Chicago. Um, you can find more information on our project um, website, um, which is at blogs.cornell.edu slash urban CEA. And a little bit more about the overall objectives of the project. So with the economists on the team, we do kind of this initial food systems analysis. So looking at the current production and distribution channels for these three produce items. Uh, as I mentioned, looking at the energy, uh, carbon, um, and water footprint of um, CEA production. Then as a plant scientist, this third objective, looking at CEA optimization. So how can we change the growing environment to enhance nutritional quality and resource use efficiency? Uh, and, um, and then we have a nice uh, part of the project that's uh, in collaboration with Anu Rangarajan, who's a faculty member in horticulture at Cornell, developing um, peer networks for urban CEA and workforce uh, development. So some initial screening of what skill sets and training pathways are, are necessary um, to make sure that there's a, a skilled workforce in CEA. So maybe I won't read all of our outcomes, but we want to learn more about um, kind of the, the pros and cons of urban CEA, what are the current pinch points, um, and uh, looking at how plant uh, nutrient composition may vary based on the growing environment. Um, and we hope that all of our work can in inform uh, policy making and city planning and so on. And then finally, um, uh, tools to make sure that we have a skilled workforce in CEA. Um, uh, so a little bit of this, um, or some of the bigger picture of this, I found it interesting. So, so one uh, world-renowned economist <clears throat> that has affiliation both at Cornell University and Copenhagen University in Denmark had this short paper in uh, Global Food Security a couple years ago in 2018. Um, and the title is, Is it Time to Take Indoor Vertical Farming Seriously? Um, and the abstract was very short. Um, he said, my answer is yes, and here are five reasons why. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Pinstrup Anderson talks about is, is we really need to understand more the economics of um, vertical indoor farming. Um, however, um, if we look at uh, vertical farming or CEA in the context of food security, um, uh, worldwide we're pretty good at getting calorie dense nutrient poor foods out to people. Um, but where we see the main bottlenecks now in food security are um, these rapid increase in urban households that have um, micronutrient deficiencies. Um, and the paper says it's no secret that access to a healthy and diversified diet, which includes vegetables and other micronutrient dense foods, is the key to sustainable elimination of this public health problem. 
So we have to get people to eat more fruits and vegetables, regardless of how we grow them. Um, and it could be as we become an increasingly urban population around the world that more production in urban environments can help us accomplish that. Um, so if we look at leafy greens, which is the crop that we'll be talking about today, um, in the literature, leafy greens are reported to be an important source of protein, dietary fiber, um, vitamins, um, including vitamin A and beta carotene, um, carotenoids, um, vitamin C, vitamin K1, um, and several of the mineral elements as well. They're an important source. Um, and traditionally we grow these in field soils and so we're curious if um, growing them um, indoors in either a greenhouse or a vertical farm um, in a recirculating hydroponic nutrient solution how that would affect the um, nutrition of leafy greens. Um, there's not so much literature on this topic. So um, this, as uh, Dr. Kubota says, this question comes up a lot. Like what is the nutrition like for um, hydroponically grown versus um, field grown? Um, and there's very little literature. I did find one paper, um, this was from a Canadian researcher. It was in the International Journal of Agronomy in 2015. Um, and um, this paper, they looked at tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuce, and arugula. Um, and they grew hydroponic greenhouse uh, cultivars of each of these four types of vegetables. And they also went to supermarkets and purchased uh, examples of each of those four types of vegetables. Um, and obviously it's not, and they admit this, it's not a great experimental design in that they don't have the same cultivars as they're hydroponically grown. So, so the effects that you get, um, it, you can't really tell a clear difference between um, greenhouse and store-bought um, because they could be cultivar uh, specific differences. Um, they did show um, on average that when they looked at the greenhouse and store-bought uh, products, there weren't clear differences in mineral content, fiber, or antioxidant capacity, at least the way they measured it. Um, they looked at some of the specific um, nutraceutical compounds like carotenoids, beta carotene, and lycopene. And there weren't clear patterns in greenhouse versus store-bought. There were some cases where um, greenhouse um, gave uh, higher amounts, um, but, uh, but it depended on the cultivar. So maybe one greenhouse cultivar was higher than one field cultivar, for example. But there wasn't like across the board uh, differences. Um, they did find that store-bought lettuce and arugula had higher lutein content, which is kind of interesting. And we'll talk more about uh, lutein uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Neiman. Um, they also uh, grew hydroponic vegetables and stored them in a refrigerator for zero, three, or six days. And they didn't find a dramatic effect on the phytonutrients that they studied, uh, which bodes well, I guess, for like, like post-harvest storage. Um, so with that, so that's just a little bit of background. I'll let Dr. Neiman now talk about the, um, the kind of comprehensive study that we did with three kale cultivars in these, these three different growing environments. Um, hi guys, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, so this is a collaboration between Cornell and RPI. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is kind of um, present uh, shortly a case study about three, three kale cultivars, uh, mainly um, the red boar, um, winter boar, and Toscano. And um, these three kale cultivars uh, were kind of exposed to three different environments, mainly greenhouse field and the growth chamber. So what I will do shortly is to go over the motivation and experimental procedures and then followed by some uh, results. And then at the end of um, my part here with the three uh, case, uh, the case study of three kale cultivars, uh, Dr. Matson will take over at the end with another study that relates to uh, a, a separate question like what is uh, the nutrient composition or concentration uh, between the cultivars of kale. And then we'll give you some conclusions and acknowledgements at the end. So can you do the next slide? So <clears throat> in front of you here is um, something that's called the vilocentin cycle. The vilocentin cycle um, is something that's found in higher plants um, as well as algae and other places. Um, so 
the vilosentin uh, can be converted to anthrosentin and zeaxanthin um, if uh, we have excess light. If we have this excess light, uh, which is typically um, kind of a thousand micromoles per square meter uh, and second or a thousand par uh, value um, is, um, the, this conversion takes naturally place and it's called a de-epoxidation. If we have low light, um, this uh, zeaxanthin can be <clears throat> converted back to vilosantin. Um, and so it's a cyclic formation, um, either going from vilosantin to zeaxanthin or zeaxanthin to vilosantin. And so, um, next slide. So why are we actually looking and uh, why are we kind of um, interested in this specific cycle? Um, the reason is that there are two xanthophils, uh, mainly lutein and zeaxanthin. <clears throat> you can see that they are, are kind of identical. They have the identical chemical formula of um, C40H56O2. Both are kind of very similar, except this double bond and that in lutein is over here and for zeaxanthin is over there. So they are seroisomers. Um, and um, lutein is synthesized from alpha carotene and then zeaxanthin is synthesized from beta carotene. So again, why lutein and zeaxanthin? You can do the next slide. So um, <clears throat> it is important. So you can see a couple of things here. This first one is the human eye. So the lutein and zeaxanthin um, can be found in the um, macula of the human eye. Um, and in fact, um, lutein and zeaxanthin are found here in high concentrations, and that's kind of the motivation of the study uh, on my end. Anyway, um, these compounds are not um, produced in the human body, so what happens is that we have to actually eat um, or ingest uh, uh, vegetables um, and other, other things that have a uh, high concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin. So what do these uh, pigments do? They actually protect the human eye from um, sunlight and especially like the low uh, wavelength, uh, high energy uh, photons. And um, it, it is believed that if you have a higher intake of lutein and zeaxanthin in uh, your food, uh, you're going to kind of protect um, yourself from um, and you will have a lower risk of age uh, related um, macular degeneration disease and cataract. So on the left side here, um, I think there's been a couple of questions not indirectly answering those, um, but if we take a look at this, uh, kale is kind of considered superfood because kale has a high concentration of lutein and zeaxanthin. And you can see that there are other foods that are high in lutein and zeaxanthin concentrations such as spinach, spinach uh, Swiss chard. We can go all the way down to uh, broccoli. Broccoli is roughly 10 times, has 10 times less than lute uh, lutein and zeaxanthin than kale. Um, but there are other greens besides kale, but in any way, uh, kale is considered superfood. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so how did we do this? Um, I am trying to be a little technical. Um, so what I'm going to show you is that we have three different growing environments, the field, greenhouse, and growth chamber. The growth chamber kind of goes with the idea that it's a controlled environment. Agriculture, it's mimicking that. So we're gonna call CEA the growth chamber. We had three different growing seasons uh, for each of the different environments. Um, and the growing seasons were approximately June, July, and then August, September. So uh, there are some differences in terms of those growing seasons. Uh, when we Take a look at this. So we have also three different um, kind of sampling stages and based on the kinetics, growth kinetic experiments that we had, um, there are, um, based on that information, we decided that to call a seedling stage when we have four to eight leaves, a juvenile stage, uh, 22 to 27 leaves, and then a mature stage when we have 44 or more leaves in a plant. 
So that caused a little bit of um, uh, difficulties in terms of greenhouse and growth chamber. As you can see, we never really um, were able to get mature uh, plants in the uh, greenhouse and growth chamber, mainly because we didn't have the space. So in terms of the field, uh, field has a natural photo period um, and obviously a very var variable light intensity. And at each, um, so we sampled about, uh, we had about 144 plants per cultivar. Um, and so we sampled 10, um, 10 plants for um, um, morphology experiments and then 10 plants for nutrient experiments at each stage. So we had a lot of samples. Um, <clears throat> The par value was measured at each sampling point. So that's why there is a range. Um, the par values uh, range from 200 to about 2200 micromoles per square meter second in a field, uh, about 100 to 1200 micromoles per square meter uh, and second uh, at harvest for greenhouse. And then our growth chamber, we have a, an actual value, but it was uh, about 200 micromoles per square meter and per second. Can I have the next slide? Okay, um, so here, um, what we wanted to show you is kind of like a photo. So here's the three different um, varieties, um, cultivars, Toscano, red boar, and winter boar, and then photos, how they looked in the field, greenhouse, and growth chamber. Um, so um, obviously, the only thing that I want you to note is the red boar. The red boar was visibly red in the field but then um, a, a different color in the greenhouse and growth chamber and mainly because of um, the light intensities and qualities um, of the light um, exposed um, on these plants. Can I have the next slide? So I'm gonna quickly go through um, the analysis and then on the extraction procedures. So in terms of analysis for all these plants, uh, we had a huge number of plants uh, we looked at number of leaves, fresh weight, stem length, stem diameter, and leaf area. These measurements were done um, at each stage, so seedling, juvenile, and mature stages, if that existed, um, during each sampling time. So uh, we would um, measure a portion of this um, uh, right um, at the site or then um, right after uh, transporting um, the leaves to um, the lab. In terms of dry weight, it's a little more, it's not complicated, but little more effort. So um, for dry weight, we have to dry the leaf samples at 70 degrees C to a constant weight. So we had to actually transport them um, back to RPI. Um, for nutrient analysis, so we looked at uh, chlorophyll A, B, rhylosanthine, lutein, and zeaxanthin. Uh, so remember the vilosantin zeaxanthin cycle, the vilosantin cycle. So there's this uh, relationship between the vilosantin and zeaxanthin, and that's why we looked at vilosantin. Um, so we used the fourth leaf from the growing tip, and we had to freeze it in liquid nitrogen to kind of protect the nutrient composition. And I will go over um, soon um, the extraction procedure. But I just want you to know that all nutrient samples were collected between 10 and 11 a.m. to make sure that we minimize the circadian rhythm effects so that we can compare between the stages and between the growing uh, environments. Okay, um, I guess we can go to the next slide. So if you remember from the previous slide, what I said here uh, was that we had the fourth um, leaf uh, from the tip was kind of frozen in liquid nitrogen transported to the lab. Um, and then uh, what happens is that we freeze this mortar on pestle with liquid nitrogen and uh, we have excess, we crush um, the leaves in um, uh, liquid nitrogen. Then we measure 50 milligrams of leaf powder into an Eppendorf vial. And actually we have a, a duplicate from the same leaf to make sure um, that we are getting um, results that make sense um, uh, and are applicable. Into this Eppendorf vial, we then add one milliliter of 80 to 20 um, um, volume to volume acetone deionized water mixture. 
And um, this is um, actually another reason uh, why we have this little portion of water to make sure that we kind of um, inhibit these uh, cyclic formations of like, for example, the bilocentin cycle. So it kind of pres preserve the nutrient composition. After that, um, you can see that we have to extract it until it's hard to see from this picture, but the pellet has to be white. So we start with the green pellet, end up with the white, um, and then we centrifuge our samples so that we can separate the solid and liquid phases. And then we take a sample from the liquid phase, um, filter that through a 0.45 micron uh, nylon syringe filter, and then we put it in an HPLC file. So this here is a schematic and um, I'll show you shortly what an HPLC looks like, but this is a schematic of the HPLC system. It kind of consists, so HPLC stands for high pressure uh, pre or performance liquid chromat chromatography. And uh, what happens here is that you have a mobile phase. So you have some liquid uh, pumps <clears throat> and a mixer that will go and take your sample with your sample, go through a separating column. Uh, the card column here is just to protect. So if there are extra particles, the more expensive uh, column is kind of supported that way and protected. In this column, <clears throat> be, um, the, the compounds are separated kind of like um, in terms of speed. So if you kind of think about balls and squares going through the system, all the balls are going at one time uh, and then all the squares are going at one time and they come out um, into the detector at separate times. The detector is then um, getting an output in terms of peak and I will show you shortly what it looks like and then the waste goes into a waste container. Can I get the next slide? So um, here is the actual system. It's harder to see. That's why I put the schematic on. So we have our solvents. We have the pumps here. We have an order sampler taking care of um, the sampling uh, automatically. And then we have a detector. And then we have the column is housed here in an oven. Um, so in these uh, particular cases, uh, we may uh, want to use a little more than room temperature uh, to sustain um, the method. So on the left side, you can see an HPLC chromatogram. So this is a typical chromatogram. Um, and this particular one is actually a Kale extract. Um, and using that C30 column that I showed you in the previous one. And in, in this case, the mobile phase, these bottles contain 81 milliliters uh, of methanol, 15 milliliters of methyl terbutyl ether, and four milliliters of water. And with that, isocratic just means that it's the same composition of these three solutions, uh, liquids going through as a solution through the system. So you can see that on my y-axis, I have some kind of a response. And this response is dependent on the type of the detector. So the detector here is a UV um, detector. And um, so um, what we are getting is a response on my uh, x-axis, I have time and depending on the interaction um, between the column, um, these compounds um, stay in the column for different amounts of time. The only thing I want to say is that the response um, is kind of calculated as the area under the peak. So the higher your area is, the higher your concentration will be. Uh, and we have used external standards to determine that relationship. And I have the next slide. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of data. Um, this particular one, uh, we're gonna start with morphology data. So we're gonna look at fresh weight, stem thickness, and um, leaf area. So for the fresh weight, um, all these graphs kind of um, are set up the same way. So on your y-axis, you have the fresh weight in grams, and on your x-axis, you have the variety. So red board, Toscano, and winter board, they are all the same um, system set up. The coloring is the same. So for the environment, I have the green for field, red for greenhouse, and then blue for growth chamber. You can see that the environmental effect on fresh weight um, on this left side, I have for seedling kale, remember four to eight leaves, and then for juvenile kale, 22 to 27, 28 leaves. 
you can see it that in terms of the seedling stage, there are not uh, statistically, statistically huge differences, maybe for growth chamber in terms of Toscano um, and winter bore marginal. But then when we look at juvenile kale, obviously field and greenhouse uh, environment uh, perform better than growth chamber. Um, just remember a couple of things of um, the light. So the light intensity in the field and greenhouse were higher than that of the growth, growth chamber uh, with this experiment. And also uh, kind of like the, the space issue. Um, we had more space in the field and greenhouse compared to the growth chamber. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so um, in this um, slide, there's two items, the stem thickness and the leaf area. So we're gonna start with the stem thickness. Um, it's in um, millimeters um, on your y-axis and then the same variety, red bore, Toscano and winter bore on your x-axis. Again, green is the field, red is the greenhouse and blue is the growth chamber. In terms of stem thickness, uh, statistically, uh, field and greenhouse uh, perform better um, uh, and about same. And again, growth chamber less so, uh, but could be explained with um, the, in the growing conditions, obviously. Again, um, the light and also the crowd uh, or the spacing between um, the plants. In terms of leaf area, um, you can see the same thing, leaf area um, here uh, versus um, the variety and um, the same thing. Just we just we have the growth chambers um, are actually fairly small. Um, so we are not able to uh, produce um, more spacing or comparable spacing uh, with the field and greenhouse in order for us to have enough replicates to kind of have um, scientific data. Okay, next slide. So now I guess to a more kind of a, a question about nutrition. So this vilosanthin, lutein and zeaxanthin, so lutein and zeaxanthin, the uh, macular pigments, and then the vilosanthin having uh, the relationship with the zeaxanthin, and then chlorophyll A and chlor chlorophyll B uh, results. Um, go to the next slide. So we're gonna start with vilosanthin. Uh, remember, vilosanthin is produced or um, when you have low light. So, and zeaxanthin is produced when you have high light. So in this one, um, this first slide, you can say a vilosanthin concentration in milligram per 100 gram of fresh weight um, in seedling kale and juvenile kale. The same thing uh, on my x-axis, I have red boar, Toscano and winter boar. And what I do have is the same uh, three uh, growing environments, the green for field, the red for greenhouse, and the blue for growth chamber. When we take a look at the seedling uh, kale results, you can see that statistically maybe not um, a huge differences, except maybe for winter boar. And just remember, you can see these um, Greenhouse results uh, for red boar, Toscano, and winter boar. Uh, remember, uh, we had um, a par value of 200 compared to 1,000 or 2,000 uh, for the greenhouse and field. So uh, drastically uh, less light, and so we would expect more vilosanthin. The same kind of goes with juvenile kale. Uh, maybe the differences are not as uh, prominent anymore, um, but still um, statistically, but there are some trends in terms of uh, vilosanthin in the growth chamber. Next slide, please. Okay, lutein, so one of the macular pigments. We have a milligram of lutein per 100 gram of fresh weight uh, on our y-axis, and again, the red bore, Toscano winter bore on our, um, sorry, y-axis, and um, the red bore, Toscano winter bore on our x-axis. The same coloring system, green field for field, red for greenhouse, and, and blue for growth chamber. You can see that there are more lutein um, found in both for seedling stage and um, maybe statistically different, at least for breadboard and winter boar, um, for, um, for uh, lutein uh, concentration. 
And um, that could be easily explained um, maybe with the reduced uh, leaf area and fresh weight and all that, um, that um, those morphology uh, results. And so we can see a higher, um, higher um, mass of lutein per 100 gram of fresh weight. And I have the next slide. So now uh, we also measured chlorophyll A um, uh, as a function of the variety of red boar, Toscano and winter boar. On my y-axis, I have milligram of chlorophyll A per 100 gram of fresh weight um, for the seedling kale and juvenile kale. And just to remind you, we can't have really the mature one because mature one was only um, obtained in the field. So we are not going to uh, looking into those, uh, we can't really compare between um, the greenhouse and growth chamber experiments. So statistically, um, we can see um, some differences, mainly the growth chamber performing better in terms of the chlorophyll A. And um, can I have the next slide? Really the same with chlorophyll B. Again, um, my y-axis is the concentration in milligram of chlorophyll B over 100 gram of fresh weight. And I have the same red boar, Toscano and winter boar. Um, you can see that kind of red boar and winter boar are similar and then Toscano by itself is sort of slightly different, um, but it's also um, a different um, um, morphology and different kind of um, composition. Um, in terms of the juvenile kale, um, you can see it's similar and and then chlorophyll be doing the same thing. Okay, so the last slide is kind of, this one is interesting because this one, uh, carotenoids. Um, so in this case, we have lutein, zeaxanthin, and um, vilaxanthin concentration uh, in milligrams per 100 gram of fresh weight on your y-axis, and then the x-axis has the same red boar, Toscano and winter boar varieties. Um, and then we have, we are comparing between seedling and juvenile stages. You can see again, the same kind of thing, uh, red boar and winter boar um, performed similarly. Um, and then Toscano, which is um, a structurally different, um, has a, a, a different uh, composition as well. Um, but when we go from uh, environments um, statistically, it's tough to say, definitely growth chamber is performing better, but the field and greenhouse in both cases are about the same. Uh, uh, maybe not for Toscano here, but uh, close anyway. So again, uh, we are dealing with a different growing environment with supplemental lighting um, and especially um, playing with the par values and the other things. So um, I just wanna make, um, sure that um, the viewers understand that these are a combination and zeaxanthin uh, was not found in um, all of the samples. So it really depended on the light composition uh, and intensity. Um, so in, um, in the field, we had to have a, a really um, higher power values in order for us to kind of observe at the time of harvest. So if we harvested something that had a 200 par, we wouldn't see it, but if we harvested something that um, at the harvest um, time was 2200 par, we would see zeaxanthin. So um, I don't have a specific graph for zeaxanthin for the reason that the variability uh, in the intensity um, of light um, was something that um, was more of a um, out of our control. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so what I will do is I will give the floor back to Dr. Mattson. Um, and because of the fact that there are differences in um, the nutrient composition between cultivars, uh, we thought that it would be a really cool idea to look at uh, more into that um, issue as well. So I am giving the floor to him. Great. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Neiman. Uh, so just a few more slides and then we'll go to um, the question and answer period. Um, 
I, I want to point out there was a very nice review paper in Scientia Horticulture in 2018, looking at many of the um, factors that are involved in affecting uh, vegetable quality and controlled environment. Um, and the point that the paper is trying to make is we have many tools in our toolkit where we could uh, hopefully further increase nutritional content. So as, as um, Dr. Neiman's already discussed, cultivar does make a big difference. Um, grafting has been shown to make a difference. Um, environmental conditions such as temperature, light, CO2, uh, vapor pressure deficit, um, the nutrient solution composition and salinity of the nutrient solution, as well as biostimulants. Um, so based on the work with the um, three cultivars in the, in the three different environmental locations, the field, greenhouse, and growth chamber, um, we also wanted to more widely assess um, kale cultivars. Um, so this was a study at Cornell where we had 14 um, kale cultivars. They were harvested at the baby leaf stage, which is like the bottom photo, and then at the juvenile stage, which is the top photo. Um, and then in uh, Dr. Neiman's lab, they followed the same extraction and HPLC uh, procedure um, to study um, carotenoid content. And just a couple graphs. Um, this was the variation in um, fresh weight at harvest by cultivar. This is at the juvenile stage. And so I thought it was just, you know, quite dramatic that we could vary from uh, almost 500 grams fresh weight um, down to about 140 grams fresh weight. So about a three or four fold difference um, in fresh weight. Um, and that just makes a really nice broader point for CEA is, is cultivar selection for biomass or other uh, physical attributes is always really important. And then uh, carotenoids, um, we looked at each of the three individual uh, compounds. Um, this is the total carotenoids as Dr. Neiman um, described it. So we saw more than um, about a twofold difference in carotenoids uh, by cultivar. So, um, and interestingly, the largest cultivars didn't have the, um, the most uh, carotenoid uh, content. So some of the more moderate biomass cultivars like Toscano and Dazzling Blue had the highest uh, carotenoids content by cultivar. Uh, so certainly cultivar selection does, does make a big effect. Um, I will point out we have one study in progress uh, with lettuce. So um, in the past, the CEA group at, at Cornell has looked a lot at the use of CO2 enrichment in lettuce uh, production, um, but we've never really studied the nutritional content of that lettuce. So we know we can get higher biomass or we could reduce our, our lighting settings to take into account CO2 enrichment. Um, so this was an experiment conducted by my PhD student, Jay Colley, growing um, Rooksai lettuce, a, a red leaf cultivar, in a growth chamber at uh, four different CO2 concentrations from about ambient at 400 to about 1600 parts per million. And visually you can see uh, size differences in the plant um, in terms of the fresh weight in grams after the um, harvest. Um, there was about a 50% increase in um, biomass. Um, the y-axis is a little bit misleading because it starts at, at 20 grams, but if our control plants are at 30 grams biomass and we went up to almost 45 grams. So there's about a 50% increase in biomass with CO2 uh, enrichment. Um, uh, so what we have in progress right now is the actual nutritional analysis. So we'll be looking at carotenoids as well as um, mineral elements so that we have um, some information that we can share hopefully at a, at a future date on that. Um, just to summarize our own um, discussion today, um, Marianne, do you want to summarize the first few points? Or? Yeah, I can. Um, so for um, the three different cultivars, the red boar, winter boar, um, um, and Toscano, um, if we compare them, the red boar and winter boar, a growth chamber showed higher lutein uh, carotenoids and chlorophyll um, than the field samples. Um, we compare the mature plants in the field, but uh, we cannot do statistics comparing greenhouse and growth chamber because we really just didn't have access to that data. Uh, but we can do within the field to compare amongst ages. And um, so uh, that's in progress. 
Um, what we found was really the morphology is dependent on the light intensity and plant density. Um, so in terms of zeaxanthin, what I kind of ended um, my portion of the talk was that we did not detect um, zeaxanthin in the greenhouse and growth chambers to the due to the low light intensity conditions. So if you remember, the violacentin light uh, cycle will require about a thousand par in order for you to see it. <clears throat> so it is really dependent on the light intensity par at harvest. So oftentimes when you see lutein and zeaxanthin values uh, uh, provided, if they are provided, um, they are mainly due to lutein. Um, so, um, and then I will give this floor back to <laughs> Dr. <laughs> right, right. And then for the cultivar study, we did see a wide variation in biomass and carotenoid content within 14 kale cultivars. So cultivar selection beyond uh, the effect of the environment, just straight up cultivar selection could be a useful tool in the toolkit. Um, and I think our studies show lots of room for future research. Um, in, in our case, our plants were uh, kind of flash frozen at um, harvest. Um, so we didn't look at the effect of post harvest time, but a, a different study would be really interesting to look at if something is grown 3000 miles away from where it's consumed and it takes maybe six extra days to get to market. Um, what is the effect of that um, cold chain and additional time on the nutritional content versus a CEA grown product that might uh, take a day to get to market. So I think there'll be lots of interesting discussion and follow-up research. Um, we really want to acknowledge um, our two PhD students that we're, without them, this research could not have been done. They did, they did a huge amount of um, work. Um, so Eosius uh, Ashinafi at RPI, um, working with Marian Neiman, and then Jacob Holly at Cornell, working with myself. So a shout out to our, our grad students. Yes, definitely my hero. <laughs> many, many days and weeks of his life spent in the lab. I know. So good job, guys. Um, great. With that, I think we're ready to um, start going through the questions. And I see there's quite a list on the chat, um, but we, we can, um, I think Sherry would say that she would encourage um, verbal questions too.